This week, we travel into a tome that takes us into the dark and gothic world of the 41st millennium in Dark Heresy. It is the 41st millennium. For more than a hundred centuries, the emperor has sat immobile on the golden throne of earth. He is the master of mankind by the will of the gods, and a master of a million worlds by the might of his inexhaustible armies. He is a rotting carcass writhing invisibly with power from the dark age of technology. He is the carrion lord of the imperium, for whom a thousand souls are sacrificed every day, so that he may never truly die. Well, welcome back to Tome Travelers. Mm-hmm. Hello, hello, hello. This is, of course, John from Passion Early, and I'm here again with my wonderful ri- what? My wife. Own- I'm I'm now the wife. But of course. But yeah, here we are. This is Roxy. And today we are talking about dark heresy, obviously. Dun dun dun. Well, I think just to give the overview to people about dark heresy. Whenever you walk into a gaming store and you see those tables set up and there's guys playing with gigantic armies fighting each other and you see all these crazy looking figures, it's either going to be War Machines or it's going to be Warhammer 40k. Yeah, you know, Lots of Warhammer happening. Oh yeah. It is a very popular system put out by Games Workshop and there is this kind of weird other side to it. That when you know the fiction, and there's actually a character for, you know, this thing called an Inquisitor. And this is what the book Dark Heresy is about. We are in the Warhammer 40k world. And I got to say, this this is, uh, you know, we, we started really light in the realm of role play. You know, we, we hit Babylon 5. We've hit Spycraft. We are jumping into the deep end with this one, in my opinion. Because this is, this is as far into nerd core as you can get in my oh, opinion. Oh, I don't know if that's true, but it, it definitely is a different... The, I think it's a different nerd that... I shouldn't I shouldn't say nerd in case it's oh. considered derogatory, I but... I consider myself a nerd I consider a myself a nerd and a geek as well, but I do... You know, I like tabletop gaming. I have very, very little, if any, interest in, in tabletop war gaming. Yeah. It's... It's not war games in general, like um, war themed, even board games, are not anything that interests me. I'm not gonna play Axes and Allies. Yeah, uh. I'm not gonna play Memoir Forty Four. Mm-hmm. It's just that seems like something that is not something that I would consider fun. Yeah, personally. Well, it, there's also the historic kind of side to that, but war gaming in of itself, it's just. But yeah, even it's in a, fantasy war gaming, the the. I mean, we don't even play the hero clicks game, which is also very huge. Or yeah, the, but th- these all have large buy-ins. You have to yeah. you have to keep up. You know, I've never I've never enjoyed things that I have to continue to pay for, to play and enjoy and grow, as gamers. I mean, I know, and we buy more books for D and D and Pathfinder and all these other things. They put out books after books after books. And I buy more board games and more board games and expansions. It feels different than, oh, I have to buy all these miniatures so I have my horde of whatevers yeah. to send into battle. It just it doesn't cool. seem interesting to me. I may be oversimplifying it or completely judging it by a cover that, you know, as someone who's never mm-hmm. played it, but... Um, this would be the way that I would ever play the Warhammer 40k or Warhammer fantasy roleplay. It would have to be the tabletop RPG, yeah. not the war, not the miniature war game. And I, I think that's who this game was created for. Uh, I, I really truly feel that Dark Heresy was a way for them to create an interest with the roleplay aspect for gamers to pull them into Warhammer 40k. And I think they did a great job. But so let's go ahead and get started and we'll talk about other things going on. So this game came out in 2008. Yeah, and 2008 was a year of a lot of interesting things happening, at least in our country. Mm -hmm. Um, Of course, we had the election of Barack Obama. 
Uh, before that, we had a lot of stuff happening um, with the Bush administration, the $150 billion economic stimulus package. Oh, yeah. Um, that was also, I'm trying to see here what else. We have a list of things. I mean, there was oh, yeah. tons of stuff. I mean, well, the, just, oh, go ahead. Oh, well, I was going to say, like, the first thing on there that uh, really just jumps out at me, because it, it really pulls back the history, because I didn't realize it was that long ago. Breaking Bad premieres on AMC yeah, so if in that, 2008. If that gives you an idea of how long ago that was, I mean, we're talking almost 10 years ago now that Breaking Bad premiered, and now it's long since mm. ended, and is yeah. uh, was a, it was a cultural phenomenon, So I much believe. so that characters in a Disney film were based off of it. I mean, that's... What? In Zootopia, the, the sheep that were the ones creating the drugs in Zootopia were based off the characters from Breaking Bad. Oh, I didn't even, I didn't even, I don't remember even, Zootopia enough to, to be able to One of them even had the same name. It, it's, it, really? it's a lot of, oh yeah, they, they used, the, it was so much, you know, yeah. a, but anyway, let, let's keep I going. I mean, other stuff that was interesting, just to give you an idea, is this because 2008 doesn't sound like it was that long ago. I think a lot of people, especially, I mean, I'm in my early 30s, you're in your early mm-hmm. 40s. A lot of people in our age bracket tend to think, oh, 20 years ago was the 80s. I mean, we're yeah. still in that mindset that the, the 90s was fairly recent for us, but no, not really. It's 2018 in a couple months. In just a few, you know, in what a uh, handful of weeks, we're looking mm-hmm. at 2018. But just to remember, things that are in the news today that mm-hmm. were in the news then for different reasons. Uh, Vladimir Putin appointed mm-hmm. Prime Minister of Russia in 2008 so and now now we know everything that's going on and um i'm not going to get into that because we're not going to make this political in any way but you know we had lady gaga's first album. lady gaga's first album and you think Um, about how big she is how big i mean she rose and she fell and she's coming back and Mm -hmm. personally better than ever i think her new stuff is great stuff oh my goodness um fidel castro retired as president of cuba after nearly 50 years I mean, this is this is big, this yeah. is big stuff that that happened, and it doesn't seem like it was that long ago, or in some cases, it feels like it's been a heck of a lot longer than ten years. But because, uh, quite frankly, which, granted, yeah. ten years ago, I was in my early twenties, and really, Russia was not a blip on my radar as far as their politics or anything. Yeah. Not anything like it is now for people in their early twenties. I mean, it's everywhere. <laughs> but. Um, yeah. And I definitely want to do kind of a shout out to some extent, Mm -hmm. you know, that there is something else that came out in 2008, and that was the Alpha Omega game that you and I have done a a podcast for Patreon backers here. Whenever we get our Patreon page set up, we talk about Alpha Omega, which was a big RPG that came out that had weird ties, all sorts of things, Mm -hmm. and... Yeah, we yeah. have a whole episode recorded for that that I was actually going to mention later. Oh, I'm but sorry. But that's all right. We have a full episode uh, for Alpha and Omega uh, content if people are interested in it. But yes, 2008 saw a viral marketing campaign uh, called Ethan Haas Was Right that led was actually leading into this bizarre RPG called Alpha Omega, um, the beginning and the end, I think is the beginning of the end or the beginning and the end, I think. I think it was the beginning and the end. And, um, but yeah, and it was linked with things like Cloverfield. That was when Cloverfield came out and viral marketing really hit its stride. I felt with Cloverfield. And so they felt like the Ethan Haas was right. Viral campaign had to be linked to the Cloverfield films. Yeah. But uh, anyhow, like I said, if you guys are interested in learning about that, or if that is a game you have played and you want to hear our take on it, uh, we do have that episode for you over on our Patreon page at uh, www.patreon.com slash passionnerdly. Uh, we only have two tiers right now for support. Not asking for a whole lot. This is just if you oh, yeah. if you are if you enjoy what we do and you want to you know throw some support our way, we really appreciate it, and we will have gifts for you. So thank you so much. Also in 2008, beside all the other stuff that we uh, mentioned politically, on January 25th, so early in the year, the BL publishing arms of Games Workshop, a gaming company based in Nottingham, UK, released Dark Heresy under their Black Industries imprint. Yes. So we did that. That is when Dark Heresy officially hit the shelves. Yeah. But... And that's, you know, Games Workshop, which is the mega company that creates Warhammer 40K, 
Black Library Publishing, BLP, BL Publishing, which puts out their rule book for Warhammer 40K, mm. and their sub industry, which Black Industries. Yeah, it was, was just an imprint. Yeah, uh, that they were going to use specific, or that they used for a number of years for their games. Mm-hmm. Uh, I believe they did Talisman because they did their board gaming, uh, board games as well, not just, oh, not yeah. just RPGs. They actually had some games that were, you know, not just war games. Mm-hmm. And Talisman is a huge game. Uh, I think just about most of the gamers I know have played Talisman. It's not one of my. It's it's not one of my favorite games, but it is to many people a very important part of tabletop gaming as far as like board right. games go. And I feel like the only uh, edition of Talisman that came out on uh, the Black Industries imprint, I believe, was the fourth edition, but I could be wrong about yeah. that. Um, but I do remember reading that online, I think. Or I know that the fourth edition did come out on the Black Industries imprint uh, yeah. in 2007. But wasn't there the the mass market release, the one where it hit the shelves, that yeah. was not the first time that people were able to get their hands on Dark Heresy. Oh, no. Yeah. that uh, it, It's like, did they want to test the waters? Were they just going to see? It, could, is there a demand for it? Well, I, mean, I know, you know... We did read that they had done a demo booklet at Gen mm-hmm. Con yeah. in 2007. So that's, I don't know the dates for Gen Con 2007, but I'm sure it was in August, as yeah. they seem to be. But yeah, um, so I'm wondering if they tested the waters there and then were like, well, for all you fantasy Warhammer you know, tabletop guys... Would yeah. you like to see this? And how interested are you? But I, because I don't understand. I don't understand. So, so tell tell everybody what they did in December of two thousand seven. Well, in December of two thousand seven, they put out what they're calling a collector's edition of the core book. I mean, this is how it's described online and everywhere else. So they they put out this collector's edition, and they only put out two hundred copies of it, which is a really limited run. That is a super limited run, and it sold out in and, six minutes. Yeah, and so you're this like that is that's amazing. Uh, yeah, think. and so to me, it's very confusing that they released the limited edition first. Yeah, or the collector's edition because how do you know if you even want it? I mean, I guess if you're already bought into the to the world. Yeah, and that's the thing. Like uh, the people who have to have every piece of Warhammer memorabilia. Right. They, they got. You know, they got the uh, the the codex of the uh, you know there there there's books like uh, military style books for the infantrymen, like mm-hmm. uh, the, the lowest ranked soldiers, and somebody made collector's edition of that where it would be like you you this got in your instruction manual for getting in the infantry, right? You know, it's it's stuff like that that they have put out before, and so of course there's going to be guys that you know it's like slap Super Mario Brother on it and. Uh, you know, call it limited edition and how many people are going to, and then you put that out to the world. Of course it's going to sell out really quickly. Right. And so it's really, it's really interesting to think. So why did they do this? You know, why put out the collector's edition to such a limited release? But I guess I, I'm wondering if they truly were curious how much demand is there. And it makes sense because this is after this is relatively after the D 20 boom and bust. You know, so this is, you know, maybe they were curious if role-playing games were still big. And yeah, they are. Well, is, you know, just briefly before I I give my thoughts on the early release, is this a D20 game? No, it is not. Okay. Uh, it is. So this is our first foray outside of the um, extensive world of D20 gaming. Mm-hmm. But I kind of feel like, I guess, because I was, I was thinking to myself, why did they not just release the standard edition mm-hmm. and do 200 copies of the standard edition, 200 copies of the collector's edition, or even, it, you know, they would have to do them both at the same time or do the, the better one first, in my opinion, now that I've thought about it, because if they bought, if the super collector mm-hmm. buys this edition that we have, yeah, the mass market Joe Schmo version. Yep. And then two months later, here comes the super duper collector's edition and yeah. it's only got 200 copies. I'm going to be ticked because now you've made me buy this book twice. 
Yeah, true. So true. perhaps they just wanted to start, and hey, we're going to put out the super nice one. The next one is coming, but you're going to get the first bite at this one, and it's going to be the the really nice one. I have no idea what it looked like. I have not seen an image of it. I, 200 copies out there, and those people who have those 200 copies, good for them. Yeah, they're keeping them tight. Yep. The mass market came out in January of 2008, uh, a month after the uh, collector's edition was released. And then... What seems to be, there's a little bit of a discrepancy about the release date of yeah. Dark Heresy mass market. Uh, depending on where you go on the internet, some sites will tell you January 25th of 2008. Another one will tell you January 26th. And I was just thinking about that myself. Maybe it has to, maybe it was a simultaneous release, uh, you know, on both... Uh, Britain and England, Britain, or Britain well, and the U.S. And yeah, maybe it was Britain and U.S. at the same time. So maybe there was at a 6 date p.m. and, and yeah. midnight or something. Yeah, yeah you know, maybe. maybe. I say that because I've always lived in central time zone, so it's always six hours. But, you know, it could, it could be something as simple as that. Um, but either way, two or three days, depending on which mm-hmm. date that you hold to... The same week that it was released, on January 28th of 2008, Games Workshop announced that Black Industries' imprint was going away. So yeah. they said, we're getting rid of it um, because the games, essentially, their statement was, I'm not going to read their statement verbatim, but essentially they wanted to focus on what was making them the most money, which was not the games. Mm-hmm. It was the fiction. Yeah. And, which uh, we have a couple. Yeah, actually. A couple uh, of the Black Library. Um, Yep. Warhammer 40k uh, books here yeah. on in in my hand. I've got uh, Scourge the Heretic and Eisenhorn, which yeah. was definitely part of the oh, yeah. inspiration for Dark Heresy. It kind of makes sense. I understand. Yes, the book sold extremely well because at that time Warhammer 40k was the game i mean i when i think about it at that time period that was the war game everybody was playing i really am wondering if privateer pit press with their game war machine and some of the other games that have gotten bigger now in recent years i wonder if those were really on the map so probably there you know the warhammer 40k battle tabletop scenario gaming you know that might have been it that might have mm-hmm. been like the big ticket item right. out there right but yeah, so after that, now that doesn't mean the Dark Heresy went away, or that's yeah. when its journey ended, because that is it couldn't be farther from the truth, because Dark Heresy is still available even today, and we'll mm-hmm. we'll talk about that as well. But yeah, Fantasy Flight picked up the licenses, licensed those out to Fantasy Flight uh, yeah. just a month later. So in February of 2008, Fantasy Flight was able to pick up that yeah. license. And knowing Games Workshop and the way that contracting for such big properties works, more than likely that was something that they had already in the works. This probably wasn't just a sudden announcement. They probably had already talked with Fantasy Flight Games ahead of time. But it was the announcement was not until a month later, right? And and we haven't uh, mentioned it too much. I don't think I might have it might have came up briefly, but Green Renine was also doing a lot with the uh, Black Industries imprint, and they mm-hmm. continued to help. There mentioned uh, Chris Pramis, who I f- I find I believe we mentioned Green Renine and Chris oh, Pramis yeah. probably every show. We have a lot of stuff by them. We do support that company uh, very strongly. Yeah. Um, we have seen them at cons and uh, have met met Chris a couple times and he has no idea who we are but oh. we're kind of I I I saw him on tabletop and I just think he's the coolest cuz he did the Dragon Age RPG yeah. and they want to do a Mass Effect RPG but they're not allowed and so they just make my day. <laughs> yeah, Chris is an amazing person. We do love Green Ronin. It it's really interesting uh I I I have made this suggestion and I'll toss it out there. I'm pretty sure that we could start up in the gaming industry a uh, seven degrees of green Ronin game. Yeah, because they have they have literally been attached to so much. Yeah, <laughs> that I, we have looked at and not intending that yeah. we were looking for an attachment to them. But he's just done a ton of stuff yeah, in the like, industry. He, uh, you could literally tag one. You could mention a game and start mentioning, you know, different people involved in the industry, artists, mm-hmm. whatever, and suddenly you're either at Chris Pramus and Green Ronin. Yeah, but yeah. anyway, I, I think Anyhow. that'd be fun. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's the gaming six degrees of Kevin Bacon. So, and your personal history of the game. Oh yeah, um, we all we all know my personal history with the game. Yeah, I haven't yeah. played it, and, but maybe interested in this. Well, and and that's one thing that I'll say. Um, if you're a gamer and you're anything like me, where the war game 
itself. Mm-hmm. You know, you know of Warhammer 40k because you've seen the walls of minis, you've seen the the big tables of terrain, and you see these guys just spending hours and doing Warhammer, and you know that that is your yeah. experience with witnessing Warhammer. And you go down your RPG aisle and you see Warhammer 40,000 uh, role play on the shelf. Mm-hmm. My brain would have immedi- immediately assumed that it was directly associated yeah. with the mini ro- the mini uh, war game. And so this would have probably never popped up on my radar. And no. and that's not fair to the property. That's not fair to the 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 setting. It's unfortunately that's me. And yeah. that's something that you guys will learn about me. It has to catch me and it has to not turn me off. Yeah. And I think I think a lot of unknown game sales do, mm-hmm. are, are based on that. It's yeah. going to be based on do I enjoy what this is about? And to be honest, I as far as Inquisitions go, mm-hmm. I'm not a big fan of playing Inquisitors <laughs> either. So this might not have even jumped out at me as a, <laughs> as, oh, yeah. a as a role play book. But anyhow, so John has played it. Yeah, oh, and he's I've, even ran it. So yeah, no, I uh, I I actually managed to get in on this game back in 2008 when it first hit the shelves. I remember people I was talking to at a local gaming store called the Fat Ogre. Wonderful name for a gaming store to this day. It's, it's a cool shop. I'm uh, gonna say it's a cool shop. Basically, the owner was like, hey, have you heard about this game coming down the line? And I was like, not really my thing. I've never been a big fan of the power armors with the Warhammer 40K. This didn't do anything during my bell. And he's just like, no, 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 you got to understand. It's a little something like Dune. It's a little something like a lot of these other space opera series. And I was like, okay, well, you've piqued my interest. So I got in on a in-store campaign of it. I did not own the book going into the campaign whatsoever, sat down, played an assassin from a feral world, and I was like, wow, I actually had a good time. And I, mm-hmm. I, like, I like horror movies, and I like creepy stuff, and this game is definitely rife with it. So I, after that game, I went and picked up one of the two copies they had left, which for the rest of the table made them a little angry because, you know, you got eight guys getting up to go get the book and they only had two to sell. And, you know, yeah, yeah, you, you'll live, you'll learn. But at the same time, they got six pre-sales of these guys basically saying, we want this book. Right. And I'm, I'm fairly proud that I do have a uh, Black Industries copy of Dark Heresy. So mm-hmm. I do have like the first edition of what hit the stands. Yeah, this, you know, I haven't really looked at the book. Now, I did look at the maps because I think maps and RPG books are pretty cool. Yeah, This has a got a nice... Uh, very interesting map of the universe. The artwork, I think, is very good. I don't know. I, I, I do wonder how much of it is original. My background in Warhammer 40K is very limited, so I don't know. But I think that their choice on type font... Uh, you know, it reads very and everything easily. Else, yeah. it, it reads easily, but at the same time... They did such a good job capturing the atmosphere and how they did their layout. It's it's pretty cool. It has a lot of sketch, like the um, weapon artwork that I'm looking at right now is is basic sketch line art. You know, it's not. Yeah. I mean, it's detailed, but it's not like oh, they rendered this and they no. drew a 3D gun. No, you get a profile view, but it looks good. The tables are clean. They're easy mm-hmm. to read. Uh, also, what I like, which I don't see a whole lot of places anymore is an example character sheet, and they've actually got little insets, you know, saying this is where you put this, this is where you put this. Because um, I've had some games where I've tried to figure out <laughs> yeah, what to do with their character sheet, and I've been very sorely no, they, disappointed that I, I can't figure it out. Their instructional with that is great. They, and the instructional is close to the front of the book rather than putting it in the back of the book behind all the fluff. Uh, I do want to note that there is a career path called Scum. So... Uh, that's lovely. Yeah, well, it's it's almost the... Uh, Wedged in there between Imperial Psyker and Tech Priest, you could yeah. be scum. It, it, it's basically the the rogue-esque Han Solo character. Yeah, I, I, I figured. So. But yeah, no, it's it's a very nice book. I like the map. Uh, you know, actually, you know, it's so, it's so sad that I would walk by this on the shelf uh, by the, the over-exaggerated armor... And, you know, the big, I mean, this man's hand. <laughs> okay, so yeah. I'm looking at the cover here, guys, and or folks. This this gent, his head, chin to, chin to crown, I'm going to say an inch. Well, I'll give it an inch. Yeah. His hand on this 
Looks like a submachine gun, if I were to guess. The other one is on the hilt of his sword. Look like they could hold his own head in the palm of his hand. This this reminds me, what is that video game? Oh, is it Gears, Gears of, of War. Is it Gears of War where they have the massive feet? Yes. They're all these... I don't know if they're... I tried to play the first the guys, one, and it was just... The guy's phys- physiques are uh, it's, it's very dumb, comical. Guys. and, and <laughs> A lot of people don't like that game uh, for that reason, that the guy's bodies are so over-exaggerated. Their feet, their feet are the size... Okay, okay, ner- you know, nerds, my yeah. fellow geeks. When you read Harry Potter and you read Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone or Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, and they give the description of Hagrid... And they talk about his hands mm-hmm. being the size of dustbin lids. So trash can lids. This man has hands that big. And then feet to boot, you know, that are just as big. They're like, his legs are like trees or mm-hmm. something. I can't remember what the description is. But that's what these guys look like. And it just, it's so hokey. And I tried to play the first one like last year. Oh, really? That was stupid. Because I have played so many games that have come out since then that trying to go back and play the first one was just dumb. Yeah. It was just it was like this is this does not hold up to no. the to the to the test of time. Um and I'm having a hard time. I can't go back and play a lot of old games because Yeah, oh, I know. It's like ugh, For all that I love This the, game engine was awful. Yeah, for all that I love the Tenchu series, which is a stealth assassin series, I can't ever play any of the old games again because they were I thought they were so awesome with their controls when they are on the PlayStation and PlayStation 2. I go back now and it is so hard. So clunky. Yeah. But as I said, so I would look at this cover and I'd go, oh, what? Why is his head twice the size? Why is his hand twice the size of his head? Now they don't, they're not wearing the super duper power armor, but he's got a, uh, what is it? A shoulder guard? Mm -hmm. Do they have a fancy name for that? Probably. But he's got the shoulder guard on his weapon arm and it's twice the size, two or three times the size of his head. I mean, his arm looks like it's very small in there, but, and he's carrying like this massive satchel with all these chains and I'm sure that it, it does something for somebody, but I would walk past this yeah, on the shelf, but well, opening it up mm-hmm. and on the inside of the cover and the first fly leaf is the space map. And it looks really cool. And it reminds, and I would buy this oh as yeah. a poster. Oh yeah. <laughs> so. And it reminds me of the map of the universe of Dune. Uh, okay. See, yeah. and I it's been so long since I've seen the the map, or I don't even know if the copy I had had a map in it. This would make me want to play this. Yeah. This map, I w- I would enjoy this. And so I need to be a better I need to be a better person and. A, a, I need to be more willing to try new things, and I'm getting, I'm getting better. I'm trying new things, I but I need to, I need to be willing to pick up a book, and because I see all these books that you have upstairs. Yeah, that is why John is the tome traveler, and I see so many of these books, and I'm like, I would never open that on my own. And so, if it wasn't for this show, there are so many things that I would, I would never experience. But some of this looks really, really cool. So I might really be interested in playing this at some point. There's just not enough hours in the day right now to play all the games we've got going on. Oh, God, no. And watch all the games that we like to watch yeah. and listen to all the shows that we like to listen to. <sighs> We're just... But that's you know, that, that's the fun part to me, is that even with every game coming out, and it, you know, I kind of have a DM's heart to that, mm-hmm. we'll get to this. It might not be immediately. It might not be this year. But I promise that if you if you want to play it, if there's a if there's a desire for it, I will gladly run oh, over we got. So, oh, I know. Yeah. And I'm sure we can find some folks to play with us. And then, you know, I ran it later on for at a uh, game series that I called the Grim Dark Games. But I ran a series of games 2009 to 2010 where I introduced players because this was again during the D20 bust. And I was trying as a GM to get people interested in role-playing games again and using my talents with horror gaming to get people into it. Mm -hmm. So we ran Dark Heresy and we ran Hunter the Reckoning, which is a set in the World of Darkness by White Wolf. Right. I find it to be a very interesting property, obviously. And, you know, it's 
got a pretty good history. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. it, you know, but you know, we're, we're talking about these things, and yeah, so it, it got picked up by Fancy Flight Games, who continued to produce it. Uh, they had their first edition, and pretty soon thereafter, they had a whole series of books. You know. Oh yeah, there's what fourteen. Oh yeah, I mean fourteen, fifteen books. Yeah, they this property this kept on going. You know, they 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 did something that at that time was a big deal to me. I struggle as a DM trying to come up with creatures for people to fight. Mm. And that that has always been an issue for me is game systems that don't give me adversaries. But the series Warhammer 40k actually did put out, you know, some things for you to fight. They gave you a creatures book and uh, several things that really helped to uh, cement the universe all together. Mm-hmm. Just a super prolific game mm-hmm. when you really look at it. And I think out of any of the properties for Warhammer 40K, I think there's uh, three comparable properties. Uh, okay. There's the Rogue Trader, okay. which is these interstellar traders that basically, uh, I, I almost want to call them the, 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 the gophers of the universe. Yeah. They go and they bring trade and items all across the universe and uh, kind of operate outside the law. But a lot of times they were the ones uh, providing communities with what they needed when the empire couldn't. Right. So there was that part. Uh, there was death watch, which allowed you to play the space Marines and the gigantic armor, mm-hmm. which is another portion. That, that's probably the the more well-known portion. Of yeah. The that's, that's universe. what I always see. Is the Space Marines. And then there's the Black Crusade, which is a game where uh, you are actually taking on the role of the adversaries of the of the Warhammer universe. You're basically acting as a portion of Chaos, uh, one of their, you know, one of their servants of Chaos and these entities that lurk beyond. Mm-hmm. So those are the adversaries in this game. Right. But as far as the game goes itself, Dark Heresy, you are an acolyte mm-hmm. in service of an inquisitor. So you, you start off on the lowest rungs and the gameplay, it, it is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. Inquisition. You are the you know, at the center of an investigation into something that is a threat to the empire and you are thrown into it. You investigate a little, you follow the clues and it's pretty much guaranteed that it is going to be end in combat. Okay. You know, the characters root out the threat and eliminate them. So it, it, it really is a straightforward game almost every time. It is the right into the fire scenario. There is always, you know, you're, there is always an enemy to mm-hmm. fight in this universe. Uh, you know, it, it's one of those things where like in the intro, if you read further into the intro of uh, this gaming system, it says that a thousand souls are sacrificed right. to this emperor every day. You have to understand That's that this really... is a universe so vast, so huge, worlds so populated that these ships arrive every day with a thousand people to be sacrificed to this emperor. Hmm. I mean, the, the, you, the, the, the concept of this population is immeasurable. Right. And so, and, and furthermore, a lot of, you know, these souls that are sacrificed are usually psychers. So uh, you know, yeah, yeah, we'll that get we'll there. get in a, yeah we talk about that a little bit more um, in the character creation episode, but yeah, yeah. Uh, whereas psychers are your your uh, psychic uh, people, yeah, uh, and that's a huge part of this game uh, system. The psychers interact with a another dimension of power, but it's also a dimension where chaos lives, mm-hmm. and these are these dark entities that uh, are are one of the main adversaries of, you know, the Warhammer 40K universe and the Emperor himself. Mm-hmm. And psychers are usually... Uh, they are the highly regulated. Very much and so. And so you either... Chaos you, kind of uh, beckons them to mm-hmm. come and join. Yeah. If you've ever played... I hate to bring up another no, game system, but if you've ever played Dragon Age, it's essentially what the mages... Mm-hmm. Uh, you know they're required to be almost registered by yeah. by the church 
or the chantry and it's because they can they're dealing with they're going beyond the veil and into the fade and they interact with demons and if those mm-hmm. demons they are more open to possession and so these psychers it sounds like they yeah. are highly regulated because they're dealing with the plane of chaos or whatever in yes. there and so there is a lot more opportunity for bad things to happen when you're using yeah. psychic ability especially if you're not trained in it or if it's mm-hmm. if it's just too strong for you so um but yeah they they're highly regulated and then he you yeah. have the opportunity you either choose to what is it serve yeah, well, you're, you're, the emperor, the psychers are gathered up, sent before the emperor. They are either absorbed by him or they have the opportunity to serve him. And uh, those who serve him oftentimes end up as pilots of ships or working uh, as part of the Inquisition a lot of times or something therein. You know, they, they, they are put to a task of some sort. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, th- this is one of the first times that we had we went ahead and did character creation before we actually started talking about the games to you know go over it a little bit more and get an idea of what we're dipping into. Yeah, uh, just to give me a little bit of a of a running running jump at this part of the show, which I have the show notes and I've done a little bit of mm-hmm. John and I kind of uh, tag team research on it and you know kind of uh, organize our thoughts uh, yeah. together. So, but. So yeah, we did, and that's where the first inkling of, again, me having to use another game system that I'm familiar with to kind of, okay, I understand the scenario, I understand the circumstances, but yeah, so I end up making, if you're interested in hearing me make my uh, Dragon Age Inquisition Inquisitor, essentially, um, is what I kind of was going for, the Mm -hmm. uh, character that I created for that video game, I tried to kind of take some of those ideas and uh, the way that I played her and yeah. created a character for Dark Heresy because she was a she was a pretty BA inquisitor and she yeah. handled she handled it but so this is you know in character creation you know you you come under the realization that this game runs in a pretty you know interesting way to introduce uh you know a little bit of chance into the game system it uses d100s d, d percentile to essentially uh, create your difficulty. Mm-hmm. In order to get a success in this game with your skills or your stats, you have to roll under uh, or equal to succeed in a test. So uh, it, it, it's actually a fairly difficult game. I don't know if you remember a lot of your stats, but most of your stats were like in the 20s and 30s. You know, you had some, you know, it, it's, a, it's a very difficult game when you first get into Dark Heresy, which is to simulate the kind of you were dropped into the uh into the grinder Mm -hmm. uh and there is not a great chance of you coming out the other side but if you do hey you're gonna be great at your job right right and so yeah so think i mean when you think about that so here you are you have a third unit skill your good skills Mm -hmm. and you're trying to roll equal to or under that so to be able to succeed right so you're in this firefight with a chaos entity and the 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 game really becomes uh a somewhat a thinking game where you there are ways to get modifiers Mm -hmm. such as bracing your weapons hiding behind cover uh really thinking about your tactics which of course is a part of the uh, the war game itself Mm mm-hmm but you're thinking about your tactics in order to raise those chances because there, there are opportunities to add like a plus 20 to your stat based on things that you can build up. Yeah. See, I don't do well with tactics. Yeah. Especially like group tactics. And I know that's not what this is dealing with, but I think that's one of the things that's my drawback with war gaming is I cannot see, even if I can, even if I can physically lay my eyes upon the big yeah. picture. I have no idea what to do. I don't know any of that. That's just so tactically, I am not a great role player. I am I'm there for the ride. I just kind of charge in. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so. and that and it's that, that's one of those things with a lot of other role playing games. It's, you know, that we'll touch on eventually. There it's more story based, which is much more what you're interested in. Right. And the every the, you know, a good game lets the players all tell a story. But this game, it really is. This is really a game where the opportunity to role play out a smaller, condensed version of Warhammer 40k. Okay. So and I'm sure that 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 is probably very beneficial. I'm very um, 
you know something that some people that a lot of people want to do. Oh yeah. So. Well, I mean, for for the for the you know the combat happy less role play more kill <laughs> bang bang you know. shoot shoot what, 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 uh, what's, shoot him up shoot him up pow pow yeah and what, what what's what's the phrase Mur- murder hobos <laughs> you know for the for the for the murder yeah, hobos the murder out hobos. there this is definitely a game kind of aimed at them now there's an opportunity for role play always right. if you have a good gm you know yeah well and that's the thing we talk about a lot of stuff and we kind of make some generalizations about games and and what we want our listeners to understand is that it's not that we're necessarily um, we're not poo pooing different styles no, of no. play because every table is different. Yeah. Every gamer is different and every GM is different. Absolutely. So um, what works for us or what doesn't work for us mm-hmm. may be the yeah. cream of the crop for you. Yeah. And the- so, you know, if this sounds like something that you would be interested in playing, go for it. Oh, yeah. Because the main thing is ultimately a game is the vehicle for fun. Yep. You are, you, you pick out your vehicle, whatever it is that motivates you and your friends and gets you from one place to another having fun. Yeah. And so, it, yeah, that's all there is to it. Now, it I, I will say uh, the the rolling the rolling situation in this game, the mechanic, the basic mechanic, mm-hmm. just how you've described it, rolling percentile dice or yeah. D hundreds, I suppose, is and having to uh, equal to or less than yes. your target number. Mm-hmm. Um feels very Call of Cthulhu, Chaosium system, because I be. believe that's how they yeah. are run. And is... so are skills in Palladium games. Okay. So Yeah, yeah when we rolled up for Heroes mm-hmm. Unlimited, I believe. Yeah. But no, I, I actually, I enjoyed creating the character quite a bit. I, I was pretty happy with how my character turned out, and I don't, I don't have that sheet with me. I should have, but... I kind of liked it. I think I think I would like the system where I'm... <laughs> unfortunately, my strengths... Uh, Statistic, however statistically improbable it is, I tend to roll low. I have always tended to roll low. Every now and again, I can roll high. Even on digital rollers, I roll low. I love like the two d twenty system, yeah, where I'm trying to hit low numbers, <laughs> where yeah. ones are crits, and and twenties are complications. That is my uh, bread and butter. Yeah, I can thrive in that system. And so, trying to hit something low on percentile die, I'm pretty sure I can do that. Yeah, I think. Absolutely. I mean, I know it's all chance, but I just seem to have, I have, I don't have the Will Wheaton touch. I do not roll ones all the time, but I roll low. Yeah. But it, that's ultimately the thing. I mean, it's all, it, it is about the chance, you mm-hmm. know, but it's also how, wh- to what degree they give you that chance. Right. How, how much do you succeed? And that's one thing that I like about these kinds of systems where you, you know, when you're trying to hit a target number. Yeah. Okay. In, in D and D or Pathfinder, any D20 game where mm-hmm. you have you're hitting an armor class or a, a, you know whatever and you have to roll above it to hit it there is some room for levels of success yeah but it doesn't feel as much because if i hit i hit i hit mhm even if i just barely hit if i roll damage because i could i could get a 19 plus you know some ridiculous number let's say i had a 19 plus 8 and i did not crit on a 19 yeah i get a 19 plus 8 or a, we'll say even a 12. Say I'm a high level character. I'm getting a plus 12 on my, on my attack rolls or something. And so I'm getting, that's a 31. Okay. I'm hitting your AC. I go to roll damage. I could still roll crappy. (laughs) I could, I could roll a one and do a do P shoot damage because I didn't crit on a percentile where the better in the range you are, it feels like it increases your chances of, of doing good things all the time. Yeah. Instead of just, and I'm sure there's still damage rolls. Oh yeah. And so you can still get screwed over by damage rolls. I'm sure, but I, I think so. But at the same time, I I believe that the amount that you know that there is actually a set damage. If my and target an number is 36, and I roll a 15. Yeah. On my yeah. percentile dice, does yeah. that does that increase my chances of doing more damage? I believe so, but at the same time, I remember all sorts of odd things when I was playing the game. He's played a lot of games, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. So if he gets if he gets something wrong well, in here, please. Well, no, I remember. Don't hesitate. To this correct. one <laughs> time, you know, during a game that we were playing, we were uh, basically breaking up a group that were trading in Xenos. They they had captured some aliens and they were selling them. Uh, you know, which of course Xenos in and of themselves are illegal. Selling them would be equally illegal, even if you've captured them. In what this are game. Xenos? Xenos are uh, aliens. 
Oh, okay. Okay. So uh, I saw that it's in this omnibus that you have. There's a book called Xenos. Yeah. But so there is, uh, you know, this group that captured aliens and I was smart and I got myself a grenade launcher, which is, you know, of course the ultimate just shoot and, you know, whatever. But, Boys and their grenade launchers. You know, I, what can I say? But so I shoot into this room and I remember, so I did really good on the shoot and then I have to roll, I think I had to roll a D, uh, yeah, a D6 or D8 because I needed to figure out which way the grenade, the grenade lands mm-hmm. and then it rolls a certain direction and goes off. Uh-huh. And I remember that even, you know, I, I shot this grenade into this room Perfect landing, hit the place I wanted it to go, and then it rolled the wrong way, and it didn't hit anybody. That yeah, stinks. that that was yeah. that was not fun. So you but. still have you still have that element of chance, and you can you can flub yeah. it completely. Yes, even if you get your nice percentage roll. But but I, I will say I had a great time with that game, and it became uh, you know, it became an imprint of characters that I have tried to create ever since. I, I love the concept of the assassin character. I think that's is something that stays in our psyche altogether. Otherwise, you know, the, the popularity of Black Widow, you know, as far as the character goes. Right. So, but anyway, so, you know, talking about all this uh, with Black Industries, going back to the beginning, though. Yeah. Um, know, so we've talked about the game, and now let's talk a little bit, because we did mention uh, that Black Industries mm-hmm. closed down very quickly. So we're going to do a quick overview, just so you guys understand. Uh, the timeline as we understand it. Yeah. In 2003, there was, uh, prior to 2003, there was a uh, James Wallace, a Mm -hmm. uh, games creator, had a company called Hogshead Games, but he shut that down in 2003. Yes. And they were doing, um, I assume they were doing Warhammer Fantasy roleplay. Warhammer Fantasy roleplay games. They had gotten the contract to continue the production of first edition. Okay. So, but he shut it down in 2003. So that license for Warhammer Fantasy RPG went back to uh, Games Workshop. Mm -hmm. Games Workshop um, began their Black Industries imprint just a year later. Um, as a bl- as a branch of their Black Library, uh, which is their literary fiction line, they gave them the license to produce the RPGs and other games. And yes. like we talked about, they did Talisman, they did some other things, and hired Green Ronin in 2003 also to work on publishing the Warhammer Fantasy RPG, which was I think second edition. And then Dark Heresy was planned based on the exploits of the Inquisition and characters from Eisenhorn, which is the book that we have here. The it, which is an omnibus of Xenos. Malleus and Hereticus. Yeah. So uh, th- Eisenhorn and Ravenor are two characters uh, by Dan Abinett. Mm-hmm. And uh, these were huge books. I mean, these are these are things that in the world of Warhammer 40K, they are considered probably some of the best written kind of material. iconic characters. Oh yeah. Well, yeah, this uh it actually says on the back of the uh, Eisenhorn book, which there is a mini for Eisenhorn mm-hmm. for Warhammer 40K is or not. Yes. Um uh, but part to Part detective story, part interplanetary epic, Xenos, Malleus, and Hereticus, and the two linking stories are amongst the very best tales ever told by the Black Library. They, uh, it is, it is highly acclaimed. It's got some good, uh, reviews in here, but Dan Abnett, if you're not familiar with him, and I was not before we studied this show, but I have, exp- yeah. I have probably seen and read things that he has done so yeah, he has he's been tied to so many things that are mm-hmm. big he now. has contributed to the punisher war machine guardians of the galaxy nova and various x-men titles he was one of the original ninjack writers yep. which were big valiant fans here legion of superheroes superman batman and aquaman for dc and he wrote uh doctor who and torchwood dramas for bbc audio so if any of you guys have ever listened to the oh, yeah. the radio dramas those are huge for um, Whovians. Um, and then in video games, he wrote for the Guardians of the Galaxy and Alien Isolation, which uh, yeah, I what? have not played, but I have watched people play because I would probably uh, <laughs> become incontinent. Yeah, Alien Isolation is definitely a it's, grab it's a, edge. It's this. a spooky... Yeah. Aliens is my favorite like sci-fi horror film. So to see Alien Isolation, I saw some people play it one time on mm-hmm. YouTube and I just... Whew, Anyway, so the fact that he's written, he's written for some big titles. Yeah. I'm sure somebody, if you are into comic books, um, you have probably 
Yeah. Um, read some some Dan Abnett. And the the famous line of it it is a grim dark future or whatever that is originally by Dan Abnett. Like the okay. game that has come to def- define Warhammer 40K was by him. Yeah, he uh is mentioned as he is not involved in the uh the main writing for the game yeah. itself for the for the system. Um, it was written by Black Industries employees Owen Barnes, Kate Flack, and Mike Mason, but uh, major contributions from Dad, Dan Abnett. So he's the first name on there. So yeah. you know that he was uh, consulted a lot and probably gave them a lot of good mm-hmm. good information on there. Yeah, Scourge the Heretic, the other book over there by Sandy Mitchell, mm-hmm. was actually produced for the Dark Heresy game. I mean, it basically follows a team of acolytes. And yeah, so uh, it, it very about, much follows like what their concept of what they want the role play to be like. Yeah, it talks about Inquisitor Griner and yeah, she's written some other things as well. And it talks about Hereticus. Mm-hmm. But um, so, yeah. So and as we said, so we, we talked about Dan Abnett and where this game originated and where it came from. Mm-hmm. But and as we said before, it was shut. The Black Industries imprint was uh, shut down just after the release of this. Um, but as we said, it did not in any way end. Fantasy Flight continued to produce a majority of the of the books oh, for yeah. Dark Heresy and Warhammer Fantasy R- RPG uh, with their own editions and a whole slew of Warhammer 40k RPG material up until 2015, including the second edition, which was released in 2014. Yes. But um, now uh, mm-hmm. we just discovered actually tonight, John said yeah. he had heard rumors because we... We had thought, uh, as we were going into recording this episode, that we were going to be telling you that Cubicle 7 had picked up Dark yeah. Heresy. Because, but, yeah, there, there was this huge article about... Uh, not It's like yeah. within a couple weeks ago that uh, supposedly Cubicle 7 was going to be picking up... Well, we knew Cubicle yeah, 7, Cubicle okay. Cubicle 7 does have the Warhammer fantasy right. role play. A couple, probably about a month or two ago... Mm-hmm. Um, Humblebundle.com. Yeah. If you guys are not familiar with Humble Bundle, I highly recommend them. We have bought many things. I have bought video games. I have bought... Um, Series. Oh, I have yeah. bought almost the entire Doctor Who RPG set through their Humble Bundle program a few months or back in the summer for my nephew. Mm-hmm. And it, it was an amazing deal. Um, but if you don't know, Humble Bundle does... They bundle certain things. They do book bundles, RPG bundles, comics bundles. Uh, software bundles, video game bundles, and oftentimes the move, the money goes to charity, and it's a great you thing. You can you can actually de- you can actually de- denote in your contribution. You can set the sliders. How much money does Humble Bundle get? How much money does the charity that they're supporting with that mm-hmm. bundle get? And how much money does the publisher get? Yeah. So you could be awful <laughs> and <laughs> and not give Humble Bundle. Or uh, the publisher anything and give it all to charity. I mean, yeah. or get, give them very, very little. I'm sure they get something, at least a dollar, I'm sure. But you can you can do that if you want and give it all to charity. But I know we've supported uh, Geeks Who Code or Girls Who Code. Mm-hmm. We've supported uh, several charities through this. I, I mean, even like clean water initiatives, things like that. Oh, yeah. it's, it's a really cool organization that allows... Um, and you get you get a lot of content for. Yeah, I mean, they they have like the minimum price is usually the the minimum the maximum minimum I yeah. guess if you wanted the minimum maximum, um, it starts at like five dollars. Mm-hmm. Then it uh, you unlock like a second tier at a higher level, and then usually the top tier is usually like twenty five bucks, yeah. and so then you get all the previous tiers, kind of like a Kickstarter back, mm-hmm. you know, but um, and then you can of course give anything above that. So I mean, yeah. you could pay full price for all this stuff if you wanted to, and you wanted to, you really believed in the the charity, Absolutely. and I, I would highly recommend doing that anywhere, paying over and above what they're going to offer. But if you want to support a charity, you don't have a lot of cash, but you want to get some books, twenty five yeah. bucks for fifteen RPG books is pretty amazing. Yeah. So and on this we, one, yeah, it was we Cubicle saw seven. we saw that Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay they did, did they just did one a couple weeks ago, yeah. and we saw that all the stuff was going uh, through Cubicle Seven. And so when we started to prepare for this episode, we assumed yeah. wrongly. Well, well, there but there was an article that said that the Warhammer properties uh, for the roleplay were going to Cubicle Seven. Well, but well, they yeah. did. Yeah, they did, yeah. and. They're drawing a distinction mm-hmm. that we may not have been drawing as harshly in this uh, bra- in this podcast yeah. as should be. Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay is a separate property, a separate license, yeah. I guess, might be the 
proper way to say it, from the Warhammer 40K properties. Yeah. So Dark Heresy is specifically imprinted with a Warhammer 40K roleplay yeah. logo. Warhammer Fantasy roleplay is yes. now with Cubicle 7. They yeah. are excited. They have got a hold of it now. They're doing their thing. And they said, I think they said by the end of the year, they're going to have their properties coming. Okay. Um, but anyway. But Warhammer 40,000 mm-hmm. role play, which is what we're dealing with, is going to Ulysses Spiel. Um, and that's been yeah. since Gen Con. Uh, I don't know if we've mentioned them very much. We have some Ulysses Spiel materials. They are the publisher behind one of Europe's longest standing RPGs, The Dark Eye, yep. as well as Torg, which they are uh, dusting off and bringing out. Now, I don't know if they did Torg originally. They did not. Okay, so that's something that they picked yeah. up as well. Well, now they hold all the licenses for Warhammer 40K RPG mir- uh, materials, including mm-hmm. Dark Heresy, and you can get all of those on Drive Through RPG. Which, uh, yeah, it's at this moment, very exciting. I mean, I'm so happy for Ulysses Spiel. I, I, I have backed most of their stuff that they've put out in, in North America. And, you know, just saying the Dark Eye, the, the Dark Eye, they actually put out a edition for Dungeons and Dragons D20 license in the late 2000s. Okay. And it didn't do extremely well. But over in Europe, the Dark Eye is as big there as Dungeons and Dragon is here. There, see, that's hard to fathom for me, but that, it's cool. Yeah, there are books, there are uh, video games. I think they have a series of seven video games. They have uh, audio CDs where they put out uh, we, soundtracks. We have a couple of those. Yeah, they, they put out soundtracks for their adventures. Like, mm-hmm. I, I love that. Oh, I love I love soundtracks for my games. But... You know, they are really coming into their own and that they picked up this property now. I, I'm really excited to see yeah, where Ulysses Spiels go. Yeah, if they've go. picked up Torg and they've picked up uh, Warhammer 40K, it, it seems like, and I'm not sure what else they're doing, if they're picking or if they've always done their own properties. Yeah. They're starting to license other uh, well-known with, with fan base. Yeah. Fan base is already in place. If they start picking up properties like that, I can only see that they're going to go up and be become a... Oh, yeah. A a pretty big, a pretty big stateside publisher. And yeah, so that 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 to me is very exciting. So, so I'm loving that. So that's where we are with uh with Dark Heresy guys. Like I said, we do have uh in two weeks we will re- drop the episode where I create an Inquisitor and a named. I can't remember what her name is. I don't know <laughs> if I actually ever named her on the show. So, uh, if you have suggestions for my Inquisitor's name, please yeah. send them along. But that's that's the show for this week, guys. This is uh, Dark Heresy again uh, by uh, probably now, I should tell you, Ulysses Spiel, mm-hmm. uh, Fantasy Flight, maybe some of the books that you'd find it, and you, maybe you'd even find the Black Industries uh, imprint uh, edition out there somewhere. But And if any of you have the collector's edition, we would love to see a picture of that. Oh, yeah. Uh, we did not look hard enough to find them. Yeah, hit us up on Instagram with that because I would love to Instagram, see Instagram, yeah. Remember, you can always find us on Instagram. You can always find us on Twitter. We we really appreciate you guys listening. We we had good numbers for our first month. Oh, yeah. Thank also, you, Also, uh, yeah, for sure. Thank you. And if you would like to start hearing this more often instead of every two weeks, you know, let us know. Uh, we would be happy to, to mm-hmm. start putting out some more shows for you maybe in early 2018. So... Thank you again for listening and feel free to contact us at any point. We are always available and we Absolutely. are we are pretty easy to find. So thank you guys. Have a good night. Good night, guys. Thank you for listening to Tome Travelers from Passion Nerdly, a proud part of the Nerds Domain. For more information about us, check out www.passionnerdly.com and you can follow at Passion Nerdly on Twitter and Instagram, as well as Facebook.com slash Passion Nerdly. Shirts available through tpublic.com slash nerds domain. And please check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash passion nerdly. This has been a production of the Southgate Media Group. For more podcasts like this one, head over to southgatemediagroup.com.